Cross Life Broadcasting Taking the Gospel Around the World Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the service today. For the word that is to be preached. God, that I would do no violence to your word. Say nothing in myself. Say nothing, God, that is not your will and purpose. Help us to sit together in heavenly places today. And no matter where we are on this journey with God, no matter where we are in our relationship with God, let this word speak to every single one of us today. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter number 14. I will not have you stand this morning for the reading of God's word because it's quite a lengthy passage that I'm going to read. The sermon that I'm going to preach this morning is, the title does not originate with me. Uh, the thought does not originate with me, uh, but I kind of adapted it as the Lord poured into my spirit. But Luke chapter 14, verse 16, several verses of scripture, so you can stay seated, it's all right. Then said he unto them, a certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that they that were bidden come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. And so the servant came and showed his Lord these things, and then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Now we're going to get to our scripture in just a few moments. But I want to start off by asking a question. Uh, off and on with some breaks in between over the past several uh, couple of months, we've been preaching a series entitled, What Should Church Be Like? And so we have that same mindset this morning in that same theme. I want to ask you, what do you think is the purpose of church? Now, if I was to go around this morning, and I won't because for two reasons, for time, and I don't want to embarrass anybody. You might, I remember what it was like to get caught on in school when I didn't uh, like to talk in front of people. Isn't that interesting that God called somebody like that to be a pastor? Uh, but, uh, but I won't ask you, but I want you just to answer this yourself. If I was to go around and, and ask what is the purpose of church, there probably would be different answers depending on the different people, and it would span different reasons. And, and really, in our current system, uh, we, in our current system, there are two ways that we have to look at it. And I want you to listen very carefully to what I say today because uh, not that you don't have the ability to understand it, but I, I'm not sure that I have the ability to say it exactly the way that it's up here. Anybody ever have that problem? You think it up here, but you have a hard time saying it. Uh, and it comes out totally different than how you're saying. Uh, but let me preface these statements by saying in our present system, in our present day, the way church is done and the way things are, Within the world and within Christianity, we need sinners to come to church. Amen. And I want sinners to come to my church. I, I say all the time, I, I, I want all those from all different walks of life, 
struggling with all kinds of different things because all of us have been there one way or the other. The manifestation of it might be different. Your struggle or weakness might be different than mine, but the fight, the struggle, the enemy is the same. And so I want them to come to church so that they can hear the gospel and be changed. But when I ask the question, what is the purpose of church, really we have to answer it in two parts. Number one, we have to look at, we remember at the beginning of this series, I preached about the church being the ecclesia, being the, the assembly. And so that is separate in our day and age, that's separate from a church service. Because our church service this morning isn't church. Now, it's an important part of church, and we'll get to that in a moment, but it's not the church itself. You can sit on a chair or a pew this morning, and, 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 and there's people all across America that are sitting in gatherings today, singing some Christian music and different things, but they're not having church, and they're not being the church. The church is not something we have. It's something that we are. It's, it's something that we do. It's something that we are supposed to be, the assembly. And so the purpose of a church service is to feed the sheep. That paramount, the paramount reason is to feed the sheep, those who belong to the fold and the flock of God. In other words, you're saved. You know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. And if you were to die today, you know you're on your way to heaven because your sins have been forgiven and been washed in the blood. A church service is meant primarily for you. Now that is going to be a controversial statement to some because we've got an idea, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but we've got an idea that the church service is for the sinner, and it's not. It's for the same, for the flock of God. It's so that your pastor, your shepherd can feed his sheep. Amen? Now, we need church. The Bible says in the last days to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. As the manner of some is, but do it all the more as we see the day approaching. And how many know we need church? Amen. I need church. The couple of weeks that I missed because of my back, it affected me. I, I missed being here. It affected me. Uh, and and I, I don't know. Well, I mean, I'll go there. I don't want to get in trouble. But we need church. The purpose of the church service is for the sheep. But the purpose of the church, the ecclesia, is to go out into the world to take the gospel to sinners and unbelievers and to make disciples of all nations. That's what Jesus told us in the Great Commission before he was ascended into heaven. The last message that he gave in bodily form to his church. To go ye into all the world. Baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And making disciples. Teaching them. Making followers. Causing unbelievers and sinners to be saved. He said that's the job of the church. Now we are supposed to reach sinners as believers, this is where I said just a moment ago, there's a distinction that I believe the church service is primarily for the Christian, for those who belong in the flock of God. And we, the church, are supposed to reach sinners out there in the world long before they come in here. Now, that's not how it's done. But that's the way it was designed. That's the way it was intended. Now, so many scriptures are taken out of context. When the scripture says, as we read, to go out through the highways and byways and hedges, compelling them to come in, it's not talking about bringing them to a church building or even a church service. It's talking about you bringing them into the fold of Christ, you witnessing to them, you leading them to the Lord. Is it wrong to get somebody that's not a believer to come to church? No. But why not take the opportunity for you right then and there to lead them to Christ. You've already done a little bit of the job by asking them to come to church. Why not just go ahead and tell them about Jesus? Because, can I be honest, most of the time people think, well, that's the preacher's job. You're putting all the pressure on me. But the error in the church today is rooted in, this, in the error of this understanding. We cannot make the church service appealing to sinners because it isn't for them. 
And, and, and so don't get quiet on me. Well, you can get quiet, but don't get angry at me. That's okay. But, uh, but so we got to change our focus. And I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not going to harp on this very long. I just want to make sure we understand this. The church service is for the flock of God primarily. We're never going to tell a sinner they can't come. I want them to come because in this day and age, the church service is most of the time the only way they're going to hear the gospel because Christians aren't doing what they're supposed to do. But if we make church, we do all this stuff to try to make church appealing to the sinner, and that's what's going on in the church world today. We're trying to make it appealing to the flesh, appealing to the sinner. We can't do that because that not only hurts them, but it hurts the flock of God. All of the folk, we are not here to win sinners to an institution. My job as a pastor is not to win members to a church. It's to win souls to the kingdom of God. Your job as a Christian is to win souls to the kingdom of God. It's not your pastor's job to get people saved. It's yours and mine in so much as I'm a sheep in the flock of God. Shepherd can, a shepherd cannot produce more sheep. Sheep beget sheep. You know, in the book of Gen Genesis, when it talks about uh, the creation and God created all the animals and the beasts of the field and he made them male and female so that they could beget, beget of their own kind. Two, two horses get together and what do they do? They make a horse baby. Two dogs get together, they make a dog baby. Two cows get together, they make a, they make a, a calf, right? The, we beget after our own kind. And so the shepherd cannot beget sheep. It is sheep that beget sheep. Oh, real quiet on me here. I want to ask you this morning. If sheep beget sheep, how many spiritual children do you have? How many people have you won to the Lord or at least played a role in it? How many spiritual grandchildren do you have? That there's another generation that knows the Lord because of the work that you did for God. If sheep beget sheep, how many sheep have you beget? The reason why a church doesn't grow Cannot be blamed on the style of music or the, or the kind of preaching the preacher does. It's the barrenness of sheep. It's, all, it's my job as a pastor, as a shepherd, to make you as fruitful as possible. But it's our job as the church to procreate our faith. To do the work of evangelists and take the gospel to the lost. And so the purpose of the church is twofold. Number one, to grow and mature believers. And to turn unbelievers into believers. It is, a function of the, it is a function of the church service to reach out to sinners. But it cannot be the sole purpose. It cannot be the only purpose. Because if all a preacher ever does is preach to the sinner, then, the, then, then he never can feed the flock. And the Christians suffer. The problem is I, I believe that this is supposed to happen in two settings. The church is primarily for the feeding of the sheep so that the sheep can go out and reach the world and beget more sheep. It's supposed to be in two different settings, but the problem is it's been made into one setting. The church has put all of the focus of the church service on being for the sinner when it was never intended to be that. And by and large, hip, cool pastors who wear skinny jeans and, and T-shirts. If y'all ever see me in a pair of skinny jeans, you pray because something's wrong. All right? But these, these hip, cool preachers, and I know I'm the least cool person there is, so there's no point in me even trying. But the main aim, if you ask them, they say, is to bring people, to help people find God because once they find him, they'll find themselves, and then they'll find their real purpose. Now, that all sounds good, but that's baloney. Is that okay for me to say that? That's baloney. 
Since when is finding God synonymous with finding yourself? When I read the scriptures, I read that finding God means that I have to die to myself. That I have to put my flesh to death, crucify it so that I can be raised a new creature in Christ Jesus. To put off the old man and put on the new. The problem is, is we're trying to get people saved who don't even know they're lost. Even in church. Because we've been conditioned to think that if I go to church, that means I'm saved and I'm okay. And we put all, and we, we Christians have done this. Because all we do is say, come to my church, come to my church, come to my church. And so they think coming to church is the answer. No, the answer is getting on my knees and repenting and saying, God, I'm a sinner. I'm lost without you. I violated your word. I violated your holy commandments. I've sinned against the most high God. I deserve death. I deserve hell. But I know that Jesus came and died on the cross for my sins. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me with your precious blood. Put to death the man or woman that I've been up to this point and created me. Give me a new birth. And from this day forward, I'm not going to live that way anymore. I'm going to live for you as a new creature you're in Christ Jesus. That's the solution. The truth is, carnal people, unbelievers, they don't like spiritual things. And they never will. I have a, a saying that I use all the time now when I talk to people, and I'm not trying to be nonchalant. I'm just trying to add perspective. But when we talk about people doing things and doing things, and, and people act surprised, and I just say, well, they're, they, they, they don't believe. They're, doing, they're acting exactly the way they're supposed to act. <laughs> right? A, an unbeliever, a sinner, does not ever like spiritual things. They don't want to come to a spiritual church. They don't like gospel music. And the solution is not to be less spiritual. But that's what the church has done, hasn't it? Because the world doesn't like spirituality and they're put off by it. Well, they've said, well, we don't want them to be put off by it. We want them to come to church. So let's just be less spiritual. Can, can you see the problem with that? We don't need to be less spiritual. We don't need to blur the lines. We need to sharpen the contrast. We need to be more spiritual. We need to say, yes, this is different. If you don't like it, that's a symptom of your lost condition. But there has to be a change because if we're not different, there's nothing for people to desire. There's nothing for people to change to. Am I preaching all right this morning? Is this okay? Okay. We have to sharpen the contrast. We have to be more spiritual. But we've done the opposite. It's gone even so far in an attempt to attract and keep numbers. And can I tell you what I think? I may be wrong. I may be brush, painting with a bronze brush here. But this is what I even when I was praying and weeping in my office before the service this morning. Because I, I, pray, I, I, I wanted this to be an uplifting message. And I'm trying as much as I can. Uh, but I, I just felt the weeping and the grief of God. And I, I was in there crying and praying this morning. And God spoke to me. And he said it's because they're not worried about winning souls. They're worried about membership. They're not worried about getting people saved. They're worried about numbers getting into the service. And because of an attempt to attract and keep numbers, churches have went to an entertainment model. It goes beyond light shows and cool sets and concert-style worship. Secular entertainment has na is now a mainstay in the emerging church. I... I, I I try not to cry when I talk about this. Yesterday I was looking at some videos online because I was looking at some things. Because I don't like to just say stuff sometimes because you can believe me or not believe me. I like to give examples so that you can hear it with your own ears and see it with your own eyes. And I was looking for some videos for some examples of this and I was watching it. And, and, and I, was, I, I was watching it and... Uh, and there was one video of a church. This is a church service, not a special service, a church service. Where And, and I was at my sister Carrie's house, and she said, you better not play that at church. And he was, uh, 
But in the church service, in the worship, a guy got up there dressed like Garth Brooks, and he sang, not changing the words, word for word, the whole song, saying, I've got friends in low places where the whiskey drowns and the music chases my blues away. Is that the right words? Shame on you for knowing that. The church is singing about getting drunk and drinking whiskey. And then as soon as the song was done, the pastor, I guess he's a pastor, stood up there and said, come on and lift your hands and worship God. Isn't the Holy Ghost here this morning? Another church in the area. Uh, my mother, when she was in between churches one time, visited there. And she went and didn't know it uh, that day, but she went. And you know what they was having? They, they canceled the church service that day, and they were having a Michael Jackson impersonator concert. Another video I watched of a church that was playing old hip-hop music, and, the, and almost every person in there was in the aisles, even in the altar and on the stage, Dancing and shaking their hips and bumping and grinding to the music in the church. Shaking in such a way that it made Elvis Presley look like he had the Holy Ghost. And I was trying to, I knew it was bad, but I was trying not to get so emotionally invested in it. And all of a sudden, just the grief, of the grief just so overwhelmed me. And I just began to weep and cry. And I believe that I felt the grief of God. I began to weep and cry. Preachers all the time are saying profane, nasty, purposely controversial things to grab people's attention. You, you, I suggest you don't search that, but that it's going on. And I wonder... Would you say that if the house was full of angels or if the Holy Ghost and God the Holy Ghost and God the Son and God the Father were sitting on the front row? Would you say it then? Well, the truth is that church, I'm not sure whether the angels are there or whether God is there, but the, but the Bible says that the angels gather around as witnesses that they're watching us this morning when we're preaching the gospel and we're worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a spectacle to angels this morning. And if you wouldn't say it when God is, was right there in front of you, guess what? God's right there in front of you all the time. I just began to weep because the church has lost its power to blush over its sin. It's lost its power to weep over it. And instead of feeding sheep, we're entertaining goats. I'm going to read an, an article in just a few moments from a, a minister by the name of Charles Spurgeon. An anointed man of God in the 1800s, a powerful man of God. And the title of the article, the message that he gave was Feeding Sheep or Entertaining Goats. You know, a goat is always a symbol uh, of those that are outside the flock of God. It's a symbol of Satan. It's a symbol of evil. It's always been a, a symbol of bad, evil things in, in religion. In churches today, are we feeding sheep? Or are we entertaining goats? Because we choose a church today by the show that it puts on. We are an entertainment society. And entertainment, entertainment has always been an opiate for the people. For thousands of years it was such in the Roman Colosseum. And it's the same today. Entertainment distracts us from our mess. And it makes us feel good. Let's be real. Entertainment is the devil's substitute for joy. The more joy of the Lord you have, the less entertainment you'll need. I wonder, I wonder if I called the church today to a TV fast, how many of us would do it? How many of us would do it but have a really hard time with it? 
How can we have the power to pull down the strongholds of Satan when we don't even have the power to turn off the TV? If we turned off the TV and if we got rid of Facebook, uh uh-oh, y'all getting real quiet on me right there, and we realize how shallow all of it was to begin with, I wonder how many would finally get serious about their walk with God and search for God. Because let's be honest, I'm just being real, I'm just being straight up this morning. Right now, you don't need God for peace. You don't need God for joy. You don't need God for happiness because you're getting enough of a substitute from entertainment to keep you going. But it is a form of godliness. And it's denying the power of the real thing. And it's time to turn away from it. When we get to the place where we'll say that God is my goal, my goal is not joy. My goal is not peace. My goal is not happiness. My goal is not riches. But my goal is God himself. The scripture says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things shall be added unto you. Entertainment creates consumers. But God has not called you to be a consumer. He's called you to be a producer in the kingdom of God. When we feast on entertainment in the church, it's like living on candy. It satisfies our sweet tooth, but there is no nutrition. Likewise, when we feed the church a consistent diet of entertainment, those feasting on our Christianized candy will eventually become malnourished, weak, and unable to contribute to the life of the body. And as a result, Their presence will add pressure on the remaining parts of the body because sugar-fed Christians always require more time and resources than well-fed Christians ever will. There's different people. There's different stasis that we're in. When we first come to the Lord... Especially if we have no knowledge, it's all new to us. We have no knowledge of the word, nothing of God. But the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts and we make a commitment to Christ. We're a babe in Christ. And there comes a time, the scripture says, that we, when we're a babe in Christ, we feast on the milk of the word. But there comes a time that we have to put away the milk and begin to feast on the meat of the word. So there's a progression. And so there are times in our lives, especially when we're first Uh, becoming Christians or even at different stages if we're going through trials that we as saints may be more needy than other times but if you have been a needy saint for 20 years there's a problem because there's supposed to be growth and maturity that baby we dedicated this morning that my wife is holding right now Colton he's in he's at complete mercy of his mom and daddy he's a needy baby He can't eat on his own. He can't change his own butt. He can't even get himself out of bed by himself. But eventually he's going to grow into a man. And he won't be needy anymore. But that's not happening in the church with the saints. Charles Spurgeon was a mighty man of God, a powerful evangelist. He was born in 1834 and died 1892. And he wrote this on feeding sheep or amusing goats. He said, an evil is in the professed camp of the Lord. So gross in its impudence that the most short-sighted can hardly fail to notice it during the past few years. It is developed at an abnormal rate even for evil. It is worked like leaven until the whole lump ferments. The devil has seldom done a cleverer thing than hinting to the church that part of their mission is to provide entertainment for the people with a view to winning them. From speaking out as the Puritans did, the church has gradually toned down her testimony, then winked at and excused the frivolities of the day. Then she tolerated them in her borders. Now she's adopted them under the plea of reaching the masses. My first contention is that providing amusement for the people is nowhere spoken of in the scriptures as a function of the church. 
if it is a Christian work, why did not Christ speak of it? When he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That is clear enough. So it would have been if he had added and provided amusement to those who do not relish the gospel. No such words, however, are to be found. It did not seem to occur to him. Then again, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the work of the ministry. Where do entertainers come in? The Holy Spirit is silent concerning them. Were the prophets persecuted because they amused the people or because they refused to amuse them? The concert has no martyr role. Again, providing amusement is in direct antagonism to the teaching of the life of Christ and all of his gospel. What was the attitude of the church to the world? Ye are the salt, not the sugar candy, something the world will not spit, not will spit out, not swallow. Short and sharp was the utterance. Let the dead bury their dead. He was in awful earnestness. Had Christ introduced more of the bright and pleasant elements into his mission, he would have been more popular when they went back because of the searching nature of his teaching. I do not hear him say, run after these people, Peter, and tell them that we will have a different style of service tomorrow. Something short and attractive with little preaching. We'll have a pleasant evening for the people. Tell them they will be sure to enjoy it. Be quick, Peter. We must get to the people somehow. He didn't say that, but Jesus pitied sinners. He sighed and wept over them and never sought to amuse them. In vain will the epistles be searched to find any trace of this gospel of amusement. Their message is come out, keep out, and keep clean out. Anything approaching fooling is conspicuous by its absence they had boldness, conf boldness, confidence in the gospel and employed no other weapon. After Peter and John were locked up for preaching, the church had a prayer meeting. But they did not pray, Lord, grant unto thy servants that, they, they, that, that by a wise and discriminating use of innocent recreation we may show these people how happy we are. If they ceased not from preaching Christ, they had not time for arranging entertainments. Scattered by persecution, they went everywhere preaching the gospel. They turned the world upside down. That is the only difference. Lord, clear the church of all the rot and rubbish the devil has imposed on her and bring us back to apostolic methods. Spurgeon finishes with this. Lastly, the mission statement of amusement fails to affect the undesired. It works havoc among young converts. Let the careless and scoffers who thank God because the church met them halfway speak and testify. Let the heavy laden who found peace through the concert not keep silent. Let the drunkard to whom the dramatic entertainment has been God's link in the chain of conversion stand up. Yet there are none to answer. The mission of amusement provides no comforts. The need of the hour for today's ministry is believing, scholarship, joined with earnest spirituality, the one springing from the other as fruit from the root. The need is biblical doctrine so understood and felt that it sets men on fire. Over 100 Almost 120 years ago, Spurgeon wrote that. What do you think he'd say today? If someone would come to the piano, please, I want to take us back to our opening scripture. The master of the house has prepared a great feast, and he's invited many of his friends. Sends his servants to go out and say it's supper time. 
Come on and eat and partake of the bounty of the feast that I've prepared for you. But one by one, his people that he invited, his friends, they said, I can't because of this. I can't because of that. I can't because of this. And so he becomes angry and he goes out and he says, well, bring in the poor. Bring in the hungry. Bring in the tired. Go. We still have room left. Go out and compel them to come in. For those that I invited that did not come, they will not taste of this bounty. The first ones that he invited were the flock of Israel. In our day, it would be the church. They belonged to God. Supposedly, they were his flock. They were his children. He was their shepherd. He prepared a feast for them, but they weren't interested in it. Other things were more important. If my people don't want it, he said, then go out and find the poor. Find the hungry. Find the needy. And bring them in. If my, I heard, I felt the, heard the Spirit of the Lord praying in my office. He said, if my people don't want it, I will bring in those that do. Because there, there are those out in the world that are lost, and they're searching, and they're hungry. And all the church is offering them is candy. They're spiritually starving and wasting away. And the church has neglected the feast. The church is busy feasting on things that have no nutrition. Feasting on candy and things that taste good but don't provide anything. That's all they're preparing. That's all they're preparing Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. So even if the needy and the hungry do come in, there's nothing for them to feast on. God says, if my people don't want it, get out of the way for those that need it. Here at Cross Life Church, I don't say this boastfully. I say this with all humility. I say it with brokenness. I say it with a desire and a hunger in my heart for the things of God. We don't we do not provide entertainment here. We provide a feast. And those who hunger and thirst will come in. We provide a feast of the word, a feast of the power of God. We do everything that we can to provide an atmosphere not for people to be entertained and feel comfortable, but for people to come in and be changed. And there are some people that will never come to this church. Sometimes the devil torments me in my dreams. I have dreams sometimes where I stand up and preach and nobody's listening to me. Or I have dreams where things are happening. Last night I had a dream. I was in the church. And it was exci- I think it was even supposed to be this service and knew God was here. And I and, and didn't know them at all. A couple in my dream just made up. People came in and they just started attacking and, and doing all attacking and condemning this and condemning that and weren't interested in this and weren't interested in that and that. And they just left. And I, I remember in the dream, I ran after them. I, I ran out the back door. I ran after them in my dream. And I did everything. And I brought them back around. And I brought them in the side door. And I started trying to talk to them. And I didn't even remember this dream until right now. God's bringing it to my memory. And I tried to talk to them. And I said, well, listen, uh, you, we don't always do that. You know, sometimes we do this. And, and, and I started doing the things that I just read about. Before the service even started, they they left again. And I hear the voice of God saying that there are some people that will never come. 
because they're not interested in the feast. But it's our job as a church, as the body of Christ, to prepare a bountiful feast, to prepare a table every Sunday so that the hungry and the thirsty can come in. It's your job. Sheep beget sheep. It's our, your job to tell them about the feast. God has called you to be a servant of the Most High. He's called you to be an evangelist. An evangelist is not somebody who stands up and preaches a revival. An evangelist is go, someone who goes out and takes the gospel to those who need it. It's your job to tell them about the feast. Go ahead and win them to the Lord. Don't wait on Sunday because they might not come. Go ahead and win them to the Lord so that they, when they come in on Sunday, they're ready. And they can pull up to the table and they can taste and see that the Lord is good. There's some that won't have any part of it. But the scripture says that those who hunger and thirst for entertainment know those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. Would you stand all over the house this morning, Father? I don't know who this message was for. Maybe it was for me, God. Forgive me if I've erred. Give us, Lord. God, let us not be consumers, but let us be producers in the kingdom. God, let sheep beget sheep, Father, that the church may grow. Not God grow in numbers and not grow in membership, Lord. If we're never large in number, that's okay with me. God that we grow the kingdom of God by winning souls to your kingdom Lord I know that we're reaching people across the world with the gospel they've reached out and told me God if I save somebody with the gospel in Africa if you save somebody by our preaching the gospel in Africa they'll never come to our church but God that's what you've called us to it's not about membership and it's not about numbers it's about your kingdom it's about righteousness. Lord, I poured out of myself today. I poured out of your word. I believe that you've prepared a feast for this morning. That those who hunger and those who thirst come and partake and be satisfied and be filled. In Jesus' name. It's a different kind of message today tried my best to be up, uplifting. I don't know who it was for, but I have to believe that the word, something in this word was for somebody. The Spirit of God has spoke to your heart. He's tugged upon you. While I was preaching, he tapped you on the shoulder and said, that's for you. Maybe you're hungry. Maybe you're thirsty. Maybe you're spiritually malnourished. And you need a touch from God today. There's a feast. I, I see it in the spirit. There's a feast. I see tables. covered with a feast I just want to invite you I'm going to pray the word of the Lord says this step out of your seat and come partake and be filled today whatever you need come partake of it right now please don't stay in your seats please come right now as I pray Father in Jesus name